Okay, welcome to a revision video where we're going to take a few minutes to look at the economics of speculative bubbles in financial markets. For your A-level economics exam, it's important initially to focus on the generic meaning of what's called market failure and then apply it to financial markets. Here's a key definition of market failure. It's when a market in this case, the market for financial assets fails to allocate scarce resources in an efficient and or an equitable way. And this then leads to a loss of economic and social welfare. So in this video, we're going to take a look at one of the main causes of financial market failure, namely speculative bubbles and irrational behavior. Uh, there are other causes and we have a separate video on each in our YouTube series. So A-level specifications are looking for students to understand that speculation and market bubbles are an example of market failure and that perhaps a stronger financial market regulation might be needed to address the consequences of this behavior. So what is a speculative bubble? Well, it exists when the market price of something, particularly an asset, is driven well above what it should be, well above its fundamental, if you like, fair level. That's usually the consequence of herd behavior of consumers and in particular investors. We make a, a particular reference to asset price bubbles, the existence of speculative bubbles in markets for assets such as property uh, and shares. And that takes those valuations at least in the short term, well above their long run sustainable level. In part, prices are driven higher because of expectations of future price increases, and that brings new buyers, new investors into the market. And as we'll see, we can apply aspects of behavioral economics to help explain these periods of severe asset price bubbles. So here are some examples of well-known speculative bubbles that have stimulated a lot of academic research from economists over the years, ranging from the tulip bubble in the 17th century to the gold rush in the United States in the late 19th century. A number of countries have experienced significant housing bubbles, the dot-com bubble in the first wave of internet businesses around the turn of the millennium, a significant Japanese property and equity bubble from the early 1980s onwards, and more recently, the bubble in cryptocurrencies. Let's look at some of the data. Uh, many economists go back to tulip mania in the mid 17th century. And during the so-called tulip mania, uh, the contract price, the price for purchase for some tulip bulbs uh, of the, the recently introduced and, and highly fashionable tulip reached extremely high levels as shown in the purple chart here. But then they dramatically collapsed in the early spring of 1637. And for many economists, it's the kind of first fairly well documented asset price bubble in history and is regarded as a, a big example of the folly of investors. However, recent research has found that the actual number of investors in the market, number of investors actively involved in tulip mania was actually extremely small, certainly com contrasted with the speculative bubbles in property and equity markets in more recent times. Another really good example uh, was the NASDAQ boom. The NASDAQ is an American stock index which typically uh, prices the shares of the leading internet companies. You can see the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s. There was a tenfold increase in prices starting in around 1990. The NASDAQ peaked in March of 2000 uh, with a market capitalization well into the trillions of dollars but then there was a collapse in the market and it took uh, the best part of a decade or more, perhaps 12, 13 years for the NASDAQ index to, to get back to previous levels. More recently, there's been another surge in internet stocks on the NASDAQ and people are saying, is this another example of a speculative bubble? Uh, this chart shows the amount of venture capital uh, flowing into uh, companies. And again, you can see the surge in venture capital during the, uh, the deal mania of 1999 2000 over 4500 deals and again there's been a surge in 2019 over 54 billion dollars invested in over two and a half thousand deals in the united states uh, last year however uh, <laughs> the tech ipos 
which is when tech companies float on the stock market. They can go, they don't necessarily go in a positive way. So uh, the likes of Facebook and Alibaba and Twitter did well um, when they floated on the stock market with some big first day gains. That's not guaranteed. However, look at businesses such as Fitbit and GoPro and Groupon, which, uh, which lost a lot of value uh, and they couldn't live up to their, to their hype for the flotation. Uh, those companies, including, for example, GoPro uh, and Fitbit, are currently trading well below, well below the price the shares were initially traded at, leaving investors with a, a big loss. Another example of speculative bubbles is in the housing market. Uh, here's a good example. The Case Schiller Composite House Price Index using 20 of the major cities in the United States. And you can see that property prices surged. Uh, in fact, they more than doubled from 1995 through to 2006. Our index starts here in the year 2000. But then the housing market, as I'm sure you know, if you've watched films such as The Big Short, the housing market in the States reached a sudden stop. The boom came to an end, the bubble burst and the collapse of the subprime mortgage market uh, caused by rising levels of, of housing loan delinquencies and property defaults triggered a big fall in the index, taking again around a decade or more for prices to recover to previous levels. This chart shows the foreclosure rates on subprime conventional loans and you can see that uh, from a low level in under 4%, this is basically uh, loans, bad debts on housing loans that the banks call in. The, the ratio increased from about 3% to over 14 percent between 25 and 2010 of course that was the trigger for the subprime housing crisis in the states which of course then fed through a much more bigger contagion effects to the wider real economy including many developed countries across the world uh, a lot of economists think that there is still the risk still the danger of another housing bubble they look at indicators such as the ratio of house prices to income the ratio of property prices to rents, uh, mortgage payments as a share of GDP, spending on new construction. And according to the latest data here uh, from UBS, they've looked at lots of cities around the world. Seven uh, were found to be in bubble territory, the likes of Munich, Toronto, Hong Kong and uh, Vancouver. So oftentimes cities experience property bubbles because of an influx of both investors who aren't necessarily living in these properties, they're just buying them in the expectation of a capital gain. And of course, more recently, our final chart, our second, second last chart, sorry, shows the Bitcoin price, the price of the cryptocurrency from July 2012 to uh, January 2020 in our data. Uh, the price of Bitcoin, were you part of this? That went up 20 times in 2017, as you can see. But then the bubble burst, it lost 85% of its value in 2018. Recovered a bit since, but the price well below its bubble peak. And perhaps the biggest speculative bubble of all time was what happened to Japanese share and house prices from the early 1980s onwards. There was a decade long surge in share prices. Look here at the Nikkei stock index from 1980 onwards. Absolute surge in the Nikkei share index until about 1990, 91 when share prices collapsed and of course as you can see they've come no, nowhere close to that level in the preceding well, 30 years the following 30 years and if you look at residential property prices price of housing uh, this again shows an index of residential property prices for japan the surge in prices particularly from the 1980s onwards the peak reached in 1990-91 and then of course the collapse in house prices and again no sign that property prices are getting anywhere close to their previous bubble induced peak according to nick maguli a superb blog the greatest asset bubble of all time posted in the summer of last year nick has done the maths he's done the data and looking at three indicators the scale of the lost market capitalization the value of the market the scale of the price increase and the length of time it takes for prices to recover when the bubble burst, according to his data. In fact, the tulip mania was relatively small, so too the South Sea bubble in the early 18th century. The J Japanese property bubble is, according to his argument, posted, uh, you can read this on social media, uh, is the biggest um, bubble of all time. In fact, to be determined, the recovery time is now 30 years and rising. So why do bubbles happen? 
Speculative bubbles are a cause of market failure. Prices well out of line with fundamentals. Um, there is something called the efficient markets hypothesis, which challenges the idea that bubble behavior is irrational. Uh, but most economists with uh, a degree of sanity believe that financial markets in particular can be exposed to speculative phases. And some economists argue there are actually five stages of a speculative bubble. The first is so-called displacement. This is when there's a, a burst of excitement and energy about perhaps a new product, a new share, a new stock, uh, a cryptocurrency, an emerging technology. Which, which attracts the interest of investors. Then stage two is when the price of these new products and assets starts to surge as demand increases, uh, set against a fairly limited inelastic supply. And of course, that causes prices to go up. Can you visualize a diagram showing a shift in the demand curve set against an inelastic supply? Third stage, often towards the peak of the boom, is the euphoric stage. More investors pile into the market to take advantage of rising prices. Expectations are positive. And Professor Robert Schiller, the Nobel winning economist, calls this irrational exuberance of investors. Stage four, we're getting a bit nervous. Some people start to sell because they realize that prices are way out of line with fundamentals. Others start to take short positions because uh, they think the market is over leveraged and is, uh, prices are well out of line with what they should be. And then finally, stage five, the panic stage, prices falling, the herd mentality of investors switches from optimism to pessimism. People start desperately trying to unload their positions. They start to sell. And of course, in a, seller, in a buyer's market, when everybody's trying to sell, prices fall fast, and that can inflict a big loss on people. Now, this herd mentality, the herd behavior of investors, is a really important aspect of speculative behavior. So herd behavior uh, is a phenomenon in which individuals act collectively as part of a group. And often they're making decisions as a group of investors that they would not make as an individual. There are generally two accepted explanations of herd behavior. The first is the social pressure to conform. Lots of psych psychological studies talk about conformity theory, that people want to be accepted within groups. And oftentimes this means behaving in the same or a similar way as others, even if that behavior actually goes against the grain, it goes against your natural instincts. The second uh, explanation is that people find it hard to believe that the large group, the wisdom of the crowd, could be wrong. So they tend to follow the group's behavior in a kind of largely mistaken belief that the group knows something collectively that an individual doesn't. So herd behavior is basically about deciding based in part on the behavior, the choices of others. So we call this thing the bandwagon effect, or sometimes called groupthink. Another aspect of speculative bubbles and behavioral economics is the hot hand fallacy tied in with overconfidence. So um, hot hand fallacy is a behavioral bias where someone believes that they are at less risk of negative events happening to them compared to the rest of the population. Often comes from basketball, or some guy uh, hits a bunch of shots and uh, they think they're just going to carry on hitting those three-pointers because they're on a hot hand, they're on a, a winning streak. Uh, traders in financial markets who have made big money might then underestimate the probability and the risk of a fall in share prices. So the hot hand fallacy is a great behavioral bias to bring into your discussions on speculative bubble. And basically it means whatever is currently happening will continue to happen forever. Traders become overconfident. They have a mistaken uh, valuations and crucially they have, they credit their own talents and abilities for past successes. So overconfidence, the hot hand fallacy could be an inherent behavioral feature of uh, of asset markets. They believe their own luck and they blame their failures on bad luck or the behavior of others. Robert Schiller has been mentioned in this presentation. Robert Schiller, a Nobel Prize winning economist, he's done some amazingly superb work on information economics, information asymmetries, and also the psychology of market behavior. And during a financial market bubble, it is likely we see irrational exuberance of investors. People have too strong a belief, a quote here, that paying attention to the durations in their investments will someday make them rich. So they're not prepared to make those conservative preparations for when the market turns bad. 
Initially, this term coined by the Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan in a, in a speech in the mid-1990s. Another aspect of behavioural economics and speculative bubble comes from the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, two people who, again, two psychologists who won the Nobel Prize in economics. And this links to something called prospect theory. So how can you apply prospect theory to speculative bubbles? Well, this is a theory of human behaviour under conditions of uncertainty and risk. What tends to happen, according to Kahneman, is that when the financial market's going up, when share prices are rising strongly, for example, or house prices are doing well every day, people tend to become less risk averse and more willing to gamble with their own money. And that behaviour, uh, if it's herd like accelerates the rate of increase of asset prices as demand goes up. However, investors are also prone to something called loss aversion. So when prices start falling, many people are initially reluctant to sell because that might crystallize a loss and, and they fear a loss, they feel the pain of a loss much more than they feel a commensurate gain. So typically investors tend to hold on to their investments for too long before the panic sets in and prices start falling rapidly. Here are some examples uh, taken from a lecture series by Noel Rabini on financial crises. And some of these are, of course, some of the bubbles we've talked about. So the South Sea bubble in the early 18th century, the railway building bubble in the United States and the UK, uh, the, uh, the great financial crisis in 2008. And you can see here the scale of the peak to trough loss when the market reached a high to when it reached a bottom. We look at financial crises and financial instability in a separate YouTube video. So check out, check that out. So key, key factors, just to finish with, what cause, what factors cause speculative bubbles in markets, which in turn are a cause of market failure? Well, I'm think, I think we, we focused here on behavioral factors, including herd mentality and the hot hand fallacy. Uh, what drives bubbles are exaggerated expectations of future price increases bringing the speculators in and you could also make a case for saying that speculative bubbles for example in credit markets and property and equities tend to be uh, precipitated by a number of years of very low interest rates if the yield on safe investment goes down that tends to encourage riskier investment by people and businesses and banks in search of high yields OK, there we go. Hopefully this has been a useful and informative look at the economics of speculative bubbles.